Good evening and welcome to Allowed at Central Library. A pleasure to see all you Union Station enthusiasts here tonight. Um, yes. I'm Louise Steinman, the Program Director for the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. This evening is presented in celebration of the publication of the book, Los Angeles Union Station, edited by Marlon Musicant. And in one essay that opens the book, historian William Deverell lays out the premise I thought of both the exhibition and the show. He says, the history of Los Angeles offers a compelling example of the ways in which railroad technology, railroad transit, and railroad corporations forever disrupted regional balances of power and regional political economies. If railroads are at the heart of Los Angeles, the Union Station story is at the very heart of Los Angeles railroading. And I know that many of the people who visited the exhibit have their own stories to tell about Union Station. I'm sure many of you do. So I will just mention mine. My theory is that the reason I was born in Los Angeles could be attributed to Union Station. And that's because my father, um, a child of New York City and an immigrant from Russia, embarked in May 1941, um, stepped out after a night going across the desert in the dark. And he awakened in the early morning to the heady scents of orange blossoms and the tiled waiting rooms and the fountains and gardens of that beautiful red-roofed Mission Revival Union Station, and he was smitten. So my father arrived just two years after Union Station opened on the former site of Los Angeles's original Chinatown, which displaced thousands of Chinese and Chinese Americans, and the new station fulfilled the vision of civic leaders who believed that an impressive gateway was critical to the growth of Los Angeles. So our distinguished panel tonight um, will discuss some of those issues, the history of the architectural icon, and as well, visions for its future. And very briefly, you can see their larger bios on our website. Our guests include Marlon Musicant, the Senior Exhibitions Coordinator at the Getty Research Institute. She's the editor of Los Angeles Union Station and the curator of the exhibit, as I, I mentioned. Deborah Gerard is a partner at Gruen Associates, the planning and architectural firm selected for the Union Station master plan. Her father, I learned, was a model train buff. Might come up tonight, never know. Jenna Hornstock is deputy executive direct officer in the countywide planning at Metro and is the project manager for the Union Station master plan. Eugene Moy is a past president and the current vice president of the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California and has researched and reviewed many scholarly publications on the history of Chinese in Southern California. And our moderator tonight, Kevin Roderick, among his many accomplishments, is a journalist, editor, and author who is the creator and publisher of the indispensable Los Angeles LA Observed, a widely cited news website. So we're going to begin tonight with a brief overview of the history of Union Station by the exhibit's curator, Marlon Musicant. Please enjoy the evening. Thank you, Louise. So as Louise said, uh, this is a very brief overview. This is the history of Union Station in 10 minutes. <laughs> Over a century ago, civic leaders in Los Angeles looked around their city and patted one another on the back for all their accomplishments. They had transformed the shallow bay in San Pedro into a deep harbor, built a 233-mile aqueduct to irrigate the region, and thanks to three transcontinental railroads, the population and real estate market were booming. Los Angeles was clearly on its way to becoming a major metropolis. Just look at the business district with all its sophisticated high-rise buildings. But there was one thing Los Angeles didn't have, one thing that was crucial to the growth of the region that the big cities in the Midwest, Kansas City and Chicago had, and back east in New York and Washington DC. And even smaller cities like Albany and Peoria had that Los Angeles didn't have. A single railroad station unifying all the lines coming in and out of the city. This is Washington DC's Union Station, which many of you may be familiar with. A monumental gateway that would signal that Los Angeles was no longer the lawless frontier town it had once been. A union station would declare that Los Angeles was a prosperous, industrious city. A union station would improve public safety, because those same trains that brought all the new investor residents to town were on the same city streets as cars, bikes, pedestrians, and even horse-drawn carriages. And a union station could handle far more passenger and freight traffic 
but this meant convincing the railroads that they should share their tracks and facilities. This was not so easy. The Southern Pacific, Santa Fe, and Salt Lake Railroads each had their own station and were firmly opposed to this idea. So in 1916, exasperated civic leaders appealed to the California Railroad Commission, and after a two-year investigation, the commission ordered the railroads to build a union station. The railroads, who were the most powerful special interests of the day, refused, and the battle escalated, moving from one there's a fly. <laughs> Moving from one courtroom to another, all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, where the case was actually heard three times. Fast, for yeah, wow. <laughs> Fast forward to 1932. The railroads unceremoniously threw in the towel and agreed to build the Union Station. But where should they build it? Major transit hubs need to be located near population centers in close proximity to business, shopping, and entertainment districts. And union stations require vast amounts of land. You can see in this aerial view from 1933 that Los Angeles was pretty heavily occupied by this point. Attention focused on a large parcel east of the historic plaza, the city's original Chinatown, and just to give you, okay, they told me to use a cursor, there it is. Right here, if you can see the little arrow, is the plaza and Alvera Street, and then here's Alameda. So this was, whoops. Sorry, bear with me. Um, and in this view of Alameda Street, you can see from the ground level what that looked like. So uh, this is, if you were standing on Alameda looking east along Marcoso Street, and this is the entrance, one of the entrances into Chinatown at this time, and this is now one of the driveways uh, that you enter Union Station uh, with. Home to a well-established business and residential community, Chinatown was unfortunately not well regarded by many community leaders. It consisted of private property for the most part. So this is a picture of what it looked like if you actually went down that street at the time. This is towards the back of Apoblasa, the main street into Chinatown. Critics complained that the densely populated neighborhood made a bad impression on tourists and newcomers. The railroads purchased the property, some from absentee landlords and others through condemnation proceedings, and the Chinese community relocated. The railroads then hired the father-son architectural team of John and Donald Parkinson to design the new station. The elder John Parkinson was a confident, self-made man who had long been a part of the business establishment. He counted among his successes Los Angeles City Hall, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, and numerous banks, office buildings, and schools. The Parkinsons presented their design for a modern station that would complement the architecture of the emerging civic center. But the railroads didn't want modern. They wanted a design that would help market and promote their business that tied into decades of carefully conceived branding. They wanted a station with an informal California atmosphere. And to illustrate what they had in mind, I have a photo here of um, the Union Pacific Depot in Caliente, Nevada that John Parkinson designed in 1924. At the time, California, as applied to architecture, was a catch-all term for Spanish colonial mission and Mediterranean designs, all of which were deemed appropriate for Southern California because of the region's arid climate and celebrated Spanish heritage. The Parkinsons complied designing a five-story building with all the hallmarks of the California missions. Smooth white walls, red tile roofs, arcades, and connections to gardens that would charm residents and tourists alike. But don't be fooled by the historicist facade. Union Station is a decidedly modern building. A steel-reinforced concrete structure so well designed that it has continued to impress visitors since it opened in 1939, and so well planned that it can now accommodate the region's growing transportation network. And this is a view of the interior of that um, steel structure, which should look familiar to, I hope, everyone here. The waiting room with its 
um, soaring windows and the lavish marble floors. <coughs> Yet for all its success, Union Station fell short in essential ways outside its front door. And here you can see the path leading up to the main entrance with the wonderful Art Deco columns. The station was set back 200 feet from Alameda Street to accommodate lush landscaping, but it was never planted the way planners had hoped. In this proposal, almost the entire width of the station building is allocated for a formal garden with brick walkways, a path of inlaid medallions leading to the station's main entrance, and traffic circulating around fountains. Parking was included on either side of the garden. But in the end, the railroad scrapped nearly all landscaping in favor of more parking. In this view from 1940, you can see that it's almost entirely asphalt. Further west, a pie-shaped block of buildings, and I'm talking about, where's the cursor? Okay, right, so here is the plaza, and here is this pie-shaped block of buildings. Stood until 1951 when the Hollywood Freeway was constructed and cut off the connection between the station and the historic plaza. Plans for a broad parkway connecting the station to the Civic Center were never carried out. The next few decades were bleak. Passenger and freight business declined as air travel and automobile ownership increased. Throughout the country, Union stations were shuttering their doors. Many now house museums, civic offices, and bank buildings. In 1990, Catellus Development Company purchased Union Station from the railroads. Although the building was showing its age, the station's architectural integrity was still largely intact. Catellus oversaw a comprehensive restoration of the property that brought the tile, marble, wood woodwork, and chandeliers back to their original luster. But as a developer, Catellus was interested in a profitable return on its investment. The company secured entitlements for approximately 6 million square feet of development and constructed a transit center and 26-story building for Metro headquarters at the rear of the property. Catellus also sold key parcels along the southern and northern edges of the site where additional multi-story buildings have been constructed. In 2011, Metro purchased Union Station from Catellus, transforming it from a privately owned facility to one that is managed by a municipal body and thus making the station a truly civic site. Metro launched a Union Station master plan process to define guidelines for future development. In addition to improving passenger experience, the plan's goals include enhancing the visual appeal of Union Station with increased green space, improving access for pedestrians and bicyclists, creating better connections to neighboring communities, and incorporating high-speed rail. Plans for improvements are already well underway. This past Tuesday, the Los Angeles Times reported that Union Station would be receiving $350 million in state and federal grants, as well as Measure R funds, to construct run-through tracks that will lower operating costs and improve efficiency for passengers. So I think I've brought us up to today. And with that, I will invite everyone to come up so we can start our discussion. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and that was great. That was a fun <laughs> 10 minutes. Good, good. <laughs> it's a fun story. Well, and you've been immersed in it now for uh, a good long time. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is it, why do you think people love Union Station? I, I mean, it's more than just the beauty, isn't it? It's something else. Well, I think first they're imp impressed by the aesthetics of it. I mean, it's, the, the materials are, are so incredible. And it's so different from any other train station mm. that you go to, that it's just a very unique facility here in Los Angeles. Well, and let's get this on the record. I'm gonna to have to read it the way you put it in the book. It's a Union Station is Mission Revival yeah. with Streamline Modern, yeah. Art Deco, Southwest, 
Southwest and Moorish details. <laughs> and there's a, yes. there's a Navajo rug design in the floor <laughs> of the uh, Harvey house. That's right. Yeah, hey. It's eclectic. Yes. How did all this get decided? And, and I guess the consensus over time is that it worked. I, I think we all agree that it works. <laughs> uh, that it's, um, all a very harm, it's all come together in this very harmonious way, mm. which is it's pretty incredible. But um, you know, there were a lot of different people involved in the design, and it was designed over the course of a few years. And at that, in in the early 30s, and at the time, Art Deco was becoming more and more popular, and, and Streamline Modern was becoming more and more popular. Um, the first streamlined train was introduced in 1934. Mm. And so that really helped popularize this sleek, uh, aluminum, polished aesthetic. Mm. So even though Union Station came at the end of the train station boom, mm -hmm. kind of came at a good time. It came at a very, well, uh, for the design, it came at a good time. For the railroads, it was not a good time. <laughs> uh, exactly right. Eugene, you know, the past that, uh, well, we talk about Union Station as being a vehicle for us to learn a lot about the past of Los Angeles. And of course, the past is not always a pretty one, especially in the case of, of Union Station. I think a lot of people didn't realize probably until tonight that, you know, 25 years before Chavez Ravine and Dodger Stadium and that more famous uh, destruction of a community, entire communities were, were destroyed for Union Station. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? And I, I, my sense is that um, the eviction was brutal even by Los Angeles standards. <laughs> well, yeah, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Uh, you know, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of Union Station, but we forget what happened in the 100 years that preceded we had 50 years of Chinatown and 50 years of Euro-American history uh, prior. And then before that, we had a long Native American history in, mm -hmm. in that particular site. The, uh, the changes in land ownership occurred over a period of time, but some of the earliest names of California, uh, Sepulveda, Apablaza, et cetera, all were involved in various parcels of land and inv involved in various enterprises from growing uh, grapes to citrus to uh, other agricultural pursuits. Uh, it wasn't until, as Marley mentioned, that in the early 1920s then that the acquisition by the Southern Pacific occurred. Now, the folks of Chinatown um, were well aware of the, the pending acquisition, and of course, many refused to believe in that. Uh, it was not until the uh, demolition of buildings commenced in 1933 that people realized that it was serious business. Sidewalks were being torn up, uh, the uh, utilities were cut off. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. One of uh, the early residents of Chinatown, David Lee, who some of you may know was later the proprietor of General Lee's restaurant, mm -hmm. was born in <laughs> on Upper Blaza Street in Old Chinatown. And uh, in an interview with him uh, about two years ago, I specifically asked him the question, how much help did he get uh, for relocation? And his comment was, not a penny. <laughs> well, sometimes it's, the story is shortened into just this kind of clean transaction that Old Chinatown died and New Chinatown started up. Uh, I take it it probably didn't really go that easily, did it? There was a lot of planning, though, involved in the transition. So mm -hmm. there were uh, folks who were working toward a relocation plan. Uh, Christine Sterling, who had been involved with the starting of Alvera Street, mm -hmm. helped create the China <coughs> City Project, a kind of a shopping center uh, on Spring and Main at Ord. Uh, a new project that lasted longer. China City only lasted until 1949. Peter Suhu Sr., who was born on Upper Blaza Street mm. and became the, the first Chinese American uh, to work for the LA City Department of Water and Power, was educated at USC and had the ability to uh, work with the railroads, spoke English, and it was looked up to as a community leader. So he worked toward uh, a finding a replacement site for the new Chinatown. So that helped ease the transition for many, but not everybody was able to participate in the new venture, which required some investment. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring uh, Deborah into this because, uh, you know, we, we've heard through this exhibition and, you know, if, if people haven't seen it, the, the drawings and the, the architectural renderings and the photographs are just stunning. And, uh, you know, we don't have that deep of a record about that many aspects of Los Angeles' history like we do that. The idea was to give Los Angeles a grand entrance, a, a gateway that was that was befitting a world city because the, the, the city leaders who wanted to obliterate Chinatown wanted Los Angeles to be a world city. Um, did, the, did the station function that way? What, what did it say to people when they came to Los Angeles and they came out of Union Station? You know, that, that's actually a, a really interesting question, a really great way to put it. Um, the, uh, the station, was uh, was really welcoming to everybody. The way it functioned was a very clear diagram. Mm. As an architectural uh, building, it, it was very easy for people to, when they got off a train, to know where they were, to feel like they had a sense of arrival. They uh, came into this grand waiting hall and, and uh, the grandeur of the station that you saw through the photographs mm -hmm. um, was was very apparent to them. So it was a very welcoming way to approach the city. Was it a surprise to people to find such a building in this place called Los Angeles out at the west end of the of the rail lines? I, I, I imagine that it was. You know, a lot of people had, this was their first entree into Los Angeles. I know uh, it was mentioned that my father is a, a, was a train buff, and mm -hmm. uh, he, I, I didn't really think about the, uh, the uh, time frame, but he first came to Union Station when he was in the service. Mm -hmm. It was his first entree into Los Angeles, and it was probably about uh, three or four years after the station opened. I hadn't really thought about it in those terms before. And of course, this era where in which you came out of Union Station and you had the city of Los Angeles in front of you only lasted a little while until they built a freeway between the train station and the city. Yes, that, that was the first of many things that uh, started to erode how <laughs> Union Station functioned in the clear diagram mm. um, that it was. It, it, again, I just want to reiterate that when uh, the station was originally designed, there was great clarity for everything that associated with it. Um, you knew where to go to get a taxi, where the package vehicles went, didn't intersect with pedestrians. Hmm. Um, it, it was a very easy way to, uh, very well designed to uh, allow people to understand uh, the station. Was there a honeymoon period where that ever worked through the way it was supposed to, like I, a couple I, of I, weeks? I, or I, you know? I, I think the first year is it worked extremely uh, well. Okay, well that, that's... <laughs> That's at least mm -hmm. encouraging mm -hmm. to hear. Jenna, I wanted to ask you, I, I just this week in my email, I received an invitation to a, a, a media preview mm -hmm. next week of the Union Station Master Plan, which has been underway now for, for some months. And this is, I guess you could call this, it's rethinking Union Station as the gateway for Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Uh, can you give us a little hint of what we're, oh, by the way, the email ha says you're gonna be hosting the event. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you give us a little hint on, on, on what will be in the master plan? Yeah, sure. So we uh, started on this master plan in August of 2012. So it's been about 20 months, and, and Deborah here is leading up our consultant team um, for that work. And what we've been trying to do is be really public. First, we started by getting some input on people's vision for the station. I mean, the station is so important to Los Angeles, not only to the transit riders who use it, but the people who love it for its history. So we've started this process just hearing what people thought about it, how it was functioning, and what their vision for it in the future was. And then we've come back out again with some preliminary ideas about how to bring back what Deborah was talking about, this functionality of the space that was actually inherent in the design. And so we got feedback on that, and we picked a direction for our master plan founded on two really large transit improvements. One is to create a really large expanded concourse area where, where some of you might think of what we call, what's called the tunnel. We're trying to call it the passageway because we think the tunnel sounds a little gothic. Um, but when you come in from the- Is it not gonna look like a tunnel anymore? Well, we're going to try not to have it oh. feel like a tunnel. We're going to dramatically <laughs> expand that space because actually the way the transit functions now, that is where the majority of people are entering the station. They're coming off trains into that space. Mm -hmm. And since we added on the east side, as, as Marlon showed you, in the 90s with our bus plaza and a portal there, people are a little lost. They come into that space and they don't know which way to go and which way to face, and it's kind of narrow. So we want to create this great, grand, welcoming concourse that's similar to other great train stations you know, across the United States and in, in other countries. Um, the second main transit improvement is we're proposing to relocate our bus plaza, which is on the east side of the property, and relocate it to the west side at the same level of the rail yard. So for you guys who are familiar with our rail yard, we've got 
you know, all of our conventional rail, and we've got our gold line light rail, and then next to that we would have a bus facility where we would co-locate all the buses which are now spread across the site. Mm. So we brought that idea um, to the public and to our board last fall in September and October. Everybody said, okay, go forward with that. And now we're doing really a progress check-in. We've done some more work. Our team has done more work on the conceptual design of that, really thinking about how it would work. And because we have these foundational building blocks, we've now added on the other layers of connectivity. So the bike, the ways that bikes get across the site and where they park and where we need more parking, where we could have development on the site, um, the great pedestrian paths and the landscaping. So what we're showing um, to the media and to our public, we have a community workshop on June 5th at Metro's in our boardroom <coughs> at 6 p.m. So what we'll be showing is building on these initial plans that we've shared. Mm. And I should say that Jenna and Deborah are both working on, on the master plan. Yes. Right. And I take it there's also part of this project will be to bring in some commercial development and sort of build out around the station, is that, as I understand it, with um, uh, multi-use and, and other sort of um, additions that will make it feel more like the center of the city? Uh, sure. Fun yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And one of the challenges is there's not a whole lot of obvious parcels to mm. build on around uh, Union Station. Can uh, you start over on those two on Alameda? <laughs> not, not, uh, not, not so much. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, so, so uh, Catullus built on some of the easier parcels. Yes. Um, so they took the things that weren't encumbered by mm. uh, rail, which is not, uh, you know, not a... Str uh, strange concept. I mean, it, it makes sense from one perspective, but it doesn't work very well for the train station. Mm. And uh, and so finding and creating those development parcels uh, is has been one of the many challenges uh, with the master plan, but we think we've come up with some really uh, interesting solutions to it. Well, I, I think it was Christopher Hawthorne who said that, he wrote that there's more people using uh, Union Station on a day-to-day -day basis today than there was in 1940, and that by 2020 or 2030, I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what the time frame is, there'll be many, many, many more, and it'll have a different role in the city. Um, do any of you have, have a thought about that? I mean, what, what will, um, how will Union, Union Station fit into the fabric of the city 20 years from now? And, and I know, Eugene, you're, you're a native yeah. Angelino. Uh, um, yes, I, I am a native of LA, and I, I will, will uh, uh, qualify my, my comments. You know, I, I've worked in, in the planning field field uh, for various cities for a number of years. Um, I've been involved, I'm a redevelopment and economic development guy, and uh, definitely have, have been involved in the construction of more uh, projects than, than most people. But I also see one, th one goal here that we want to try and achieve is to make this a truly urban location here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are planners and folks who are looking at how to create linkages with the adjacent neighborhoods of the Arts District, Little Tokyo, Chinatown, downtown, and, uh, and so on, Solano Canyon to the north. Uh, the, the challenge we have here at this location is that, uh, as Norman Klein mentioned in his book on uh, uh, the history of forgetting, the, the erasure of memory, is that we have no trace of, of our diverse history at this location. And so I'm hoping that in the planning, in the master plan, that we implement some elements that can reflect some of our urban history uh, from the uh, Native American to the Latino, the French, the Italian, Chinese, and others who have really made this uh, Los Angeles an urban community. So when one steps off that train, mm -hmm. hopefully you'll get a feel for what LA represents. Uh, I appreciate architecture, I studied it, and uh, uh, I recognize all the, the great things about this as a facility, but we also want to find a way to, to respect the, the diversity and the history of the place. Well, and there's been some interesting writing this year in the celebration of the 75th anniversary about just how, how well a, how well Union Station plays the role of being a vehicle to tell the, the history of Los Angeles, especially you know, from the end of the 1800s and the Pueblo era into the beginning of the 20th century. And um, you, you wrote in the book that you know, railroad, the histories of railroads get told, and people have read about them before, not very often about railroad stations, and yet they tell us something. It, it's a really rich 
uh, way of getting at the story of, mm -hmm. of a city. Well, I think that railroads, railroads are very appealing. People like trains, people like train travel, and mm -hmm. there's the excitement of an adventure of going to new places, and that can be very romantic. And so I think that that has had a popular appeal for a very long time, and there are, but there are a few stations that have really interesting stories to tell, and Union Station is one of them. I mean, Grand Central Station, Penn Station, uh, the station that I showed in DC. These are stories that have very, are stations that have very interesting stories to tell about the history of place, mm. the social, economic, political, civic history of a place. I mean, the politics around the, the location of Union Station, uh, getting it on the ballot and approved on the ballot, and, uh, and, and kind of the, I don't know if you want to call them dirty tricks, but the way the... the uh, you can call them dirty tricks. Okay, <laughs> okay. The way the political campaigns were shaped oh, yes. to end up being a, a kind of a simple up and down vote on, right. do you want a joint station, a union station, and do you want it in this one place where Harry Chandler wanted to build it and a few other people, uh, or do you not, and there wasn't any other option on the ballot? That's exactly right. <laughs> the, the civic leaders uh, were very powerful. A lot of them were real estate people, um, the early law firms, O'Melveny was involved, um, and they knew exactly where they wanted the station to be built, and many of them did have investments there and have something to gain, and there was this battle not just to build the Union Station, but then there was a battle over where it should be built, and so the north side of downtown where it currently is was one of the options. There were other options, and the California Railroad Commission at one point during this legal debate asked the city of Los Angeles to take a test of public opinion and ask the people if they wanted a union station. And so the, um, the city council decided to do that and they gave the people one option. <laughs> Instead of saying, do you want it here, do you want it there, do you want it there, it said, do you want a union station and do you want it where it currently is? And I like the, the uh, I wouldn't call it a coincidence, but the, the uh the timing such that this was a time which the Chandlers and others of the of the city were thinking big and thinking about building tall buildings and promoting Los Angeles around the world in, in myriad ways. And on the same ballot was the question about whether to build a tall city hall, you know? That's which, right. And this was also about the time that um, there was a, a question about how Wilshire Boulevard should be built up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, An expansion of all the boulevards, in right, streets and the boulevards. Right, um, uh, there was an uh, effort to transform Wilshire Boulevard into a Fifth Avenue of Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. um, that did not pass, interestingly. So the people did vote for a skyscraper-style city hall, but they did not want a skyscraper city. <laughs> They wanted, uh, they wanted the single family home, they wanted the orange groves, they wanted all of, the, all of those popular images that had been promoting this bucolic uh, semi-tropical paradise. And to sell, sell it, they came up with two kind of concepts that worked really well with the public. One was uh, get rid of Chinatown, which was unpopular amongst the rest of, of the city. Um, and, and also this idea of, of safety, because uh, just describe what the streets were like in the, those days. It was interesting to me to think about Alameda being lined with trains. Uh, most of the time, and it was really, they could make a safety argument for building a station. Right, so. That's the way trains worked in those days. They <laughs> went down the street, right? That's right. If you, if you had enough money to uh, put tracks in a street and buy a train, you could go to the city council and you could ask them, uh, essentially, to, for permission to build a train. Mm. And so a lot of people did that. And so there were, we had the three transcontinental railroads coming into the city, but we also had a lot of privately run trains operating in the city. And of course, we had the, the electric cars that I think a lot of people are familiar with. And it was a very dangerous situation. Um, there were hazards at grade crossings where trains intersect with other kinds of traffic all the time. And there were accidents quite frequently. Um, you know, a train cannot stop on a dime. It mm -hmm. takes a long time to come to a stop. And the typical safety measure was a signal man, which was literally someone with some flags mm -hmm. saying, OK, go, or you stop. And um, it was a, a very dangerous situation. And, there, and uh, uh, Alameda, there were two tracks 
uh, running uh, in Alameda Street for the Southern Pacific. So they were running their steam engines up and down the, the main industrial corridor at all hours. <laughs> and, and there was yet another train line between there and the river that was busy as well, the Santa Fe. The Santa Fe, so. yes. And both, so both sides of the river hmm. were and lined well. with, with tracks, absolutely. And they all had their own stations. And they all had their own stations. Any of those stations still exist? that we can see? N unfortunately, none of those stations still exist. Or maybe fortunately, because now we have Union Station. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you can see pictures of them upstairs in the exhibition. <laughs> exactly. Well, someone mentioned uh, Christine Sterling earlier. Uh, I think it was you, Eugene. Yeah. What, was, what was her role in, in the Union Station story? Just an interesting character from Los Angeles history. I mean, Alvera Street and Chinatown. Well, Christine was, was an interesting person who uh, was very well connected with uh, LA city circles and with the Los Angeles Times and she was a promoter of LA. So there was a time in the early 20th century when the novels of Ramona and uh, the romanticism of early California captured the imagination. We began to have fiestas and rose parades and uh, other activities that promoted the uh, history of early California. Mm. So Christine uh, wanted to help capture some of the, the, that feeling and help create Olvera Street mm. and then ultimately help create China City. Uh, and both of those uh, involved um, uh, establishing shops and craftspeople and, and artists to, in a sort of a Hollywood way, uh, uh, demonstrate, depict um, the history of California. It was very romanticized and uh, maybe sanitized would be the uh, <laughs> way to say it. Uh, so some of her, her uh, Alvera Street venture has obviously um, continued to this day, but China City unfortunately did not. Well, I must say as I hear you talk about a master plan to kind of give a theme, grow out the theme of Union Station. I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to see another, you know, an Alvera Street type thing, uh, you know, a fictional, you know, um, I don't know, Mexican street inside Union Station. I don't know. Is that part of the plan? It, so. That is not part of the plan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe he's suggesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think I would add that, um, and, and Eugene mentioned this earlier, um, when we started our outreach process, one of the first things we heard from our constituents, we heard two main things. One is, we're lost at the station now, do something about that. So we have done, we're about 85% done installing a whole new environmental graphics and signage program. Mm. But the second thing we heard was, that's great, you're doing a master plan, but how do we get to and from the station? We, it's really disconnected. And I mean, case in point, if I stand out in front of the station with my Metro badge on, I regularly have tourists asking me, where is Alvera Street? Mm. I mean, I'm standing on Alameda mm. across the street, you know, from El Pueblo and Alvera Street, and it's just, there's not a clear connection. So what we've been able to do with both our master plan team and then this linkages study is look at ways to recreate that connection. So rather than try to put an Alvera Street on the station, we want a better sense of just flowing out the front of the station into the heart of the city with some really great enhancements on Alameda. It was really nice to see the early image of the parking as a oh. large uh, forecourt because we are proposing to take out a fair chunk of the parking, the, the part that we own. We don't own part of the parking on the mm. southern part, but to have this open plaza that can connect street, you know, seamlessly across the street. So we'll be connected to Alvera Street. I take it that, uh, that this decision to um, end the stub end rail lines and build rail lines straight through is a pretty important um, step to take. Mm -hmm. And what, can you explain to us how that's important? And then I'm also curious, you know, why they built it that way in the first place. Well, I can tell you why it's important. I mean, the, the becoming a, a, what they call a run-through station, where instead of the trains, you know, coming in and they have to reinitiate and go back out, that, that's been a desire for, for several years now with the increase in, in commuter rail, which is our Metrolink system. And then Amtrak has, you know, picked up we're the fifth busiest Amtrak station in the United States. So there's a real constraint. And, and you talked about num about people and numbers of people. At the heyday of the station in the 40s, there were about 6,000 people there a day. And it's about double the amount of trips, about 13,000 trips, because it's getting on and off trains. Today, we're at about 65 to 70,000 people a day and about 113,000 trips. So 
we have a lot of people moving in and out. And what that run-through project, what we're calling the script project, will do is create a lot more capacity for our conventional rail to bring trains in and out more quickly. So it's really important to, to move them in and out so we can get the people in and out. It will let Metrolink run more frequent trains, which we think is really critical to getting more people commuting you know, into the heart of downtown. It's also really important, actually, because of high-speed rail. And because of the plans for high-speed rail is actually why we're able to get some of this funding. And if, if any of you followed the politics of high-speed rail, when their cost projections came out super high, like 90, was it 98 billion? Mm -hmm. um, they had to, to rethink a bit. And they came out with this new approach, the blended system, where in different parts of the state, they would electrify the conventional rail tracks um, that Metrolink and Amtrak use. Um, and in order to share those tracks, they needed more capacity up and down the whole state. And the Run Through Tracks project, what we're talking about, was the number one project on the list to create that capacity. So while those tracks won't necessarily be shared with high-speed rail, just getting the trains in and out you know, in either direction creates so much more capacity, 40 to 50 percent more capacity for those trains, it's going to allow this blended approach to happen. So mm. it's a really critical piece of modernizing the station and keeping it, you know, as, as the hub of our, of our transit system. Is there a short explanation for why? I mean, they were talking about this, about the, the downside of backing into uh, Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning. Uh, is there a short version explaining why it ended up this way? Money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Money. So, so more, more land involved. There's more land involved. Union Station is built with stub end tracks, meaning mm -hmm. the trains come in, they stop, and they back out. And... Um, that was a big problem when the station was being planned. Um, but again, it, the money, it was just more expensive to have the through tracks. And so yeah. it didn't end up happening. There's a really interesting essay in your book by, by Matthew Roth about how the placement of Union Station, which you had all the politics leading up to that for decades, then really shaped the way the city was, the freeway system was built out and located around downtown. Even, you know, the placement of the four-level interchange is really there because of Union Station is over here. Um, That's right. Can you tell us how those things interrelate? I mean, people might not really understand that. Well, the, the well, Matt understands that better well, yeah. than anybody, but I'll do my he best. Uh, so the engineering departments at the time, the, the city of Los Angeles engineering departments, we're really scrambling to find funds to build these freeways. And so um, they, they, it was done in a very piecemeal kind of way. And they couldn't move Union Station. They, they knew that they had to work around Union Station. And so they went where they could. And they went where there were already existing um, passages over the Los Angeles River, for example. So they. The engineering departments were opportunistic and um, really had to work around Union Station and, and capitalize on what they could mm. with the station. Mm. So. so it was essentially inevitable that the, the station would be cut off from downtown by a freeway. I don't think anyone would have anticipated it, but it was inevitable, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to open up the, to questions here in a second so people might start uh, um, thinking about what you want to ask, and the people from the, uh, from Aloud will bring a microphone around to you because we want to record what you ask about and, and the answers. So watch for people um, in the audience with microphones. And while that's starting to come together, let me ask you about, and I always like to, to know this kind of question as a, someone who enjoys archives and all that, it's a pretty interesting story about how the Getty got this material, right, of these drawings and, and renderings and such. Yeah, I think everyone ag at the Getty agrees that we really were very fortunate to mm. have this archive come to us. Uh, we had a trustee named Ira Yellen who was very involved in redevelopment and architectural preservation, and he was the head of Catellus mm. uh, when they took over Union Station, and all of the drawings and all of these uh, 800 negatives of the station, photographs of the station being built, were in the basement. Hmm. And apparently there's a very good climate down there because they were very well preserved. <laughs> and so um, he came to the people at the Getty and uh, offered to donate the collection to, to us to care for and make available for research. Hmm. So that's what we've done. And you've, got, you've gotten to spend your time with it I, uh, I ever have. since. I'm very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, some of the drawings are, are works of art in themselves, wouldn't you say? I would so. absolutely say. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Um, how does this work? Okay. Uh, 
And we have a, we have a microphone, and here we go. Um, <coughs> Hi, um, Ms. Musikant. Uh, could you speak about uh, Mary Coulter, who, who designed the uh, so-called Navajo rug uh, <laughs> in the former Fred Harvey uh, restaurant? Uh, I could talk a little about her. So um, Mary Coulter was an architect who worked with the Santa Fe Railroad and developed a lot of the uh, lodges and concessions that uh, were operated along the route of the Santa Fe <coughs> Railroad. And um, she was brought in to design the, the restaurant at Union Station. So the, the railroads were... They brought consultants in to do things that they just couldn't do, and um, one of them was operate the, um, the barber shop, the newsroom, the lunch counter, the restaurant. That was all managed by the Fred Harvey Company. And so they brought Mary Coulter in to design the station and she, or to design the restaurant, excuse me. And uh, there is a, a very a patterned floor, a uh, zigzag pattern floor that looks very much like a Navajo rug. And so that, that was really, um, her inspiration. Unfortunately, there are no drawings um, of the restaurant uh, that are by Mary Coulter that we have in our collection, and I think there are very few Coulter drawings anywhere. Uh, so that that been a, it's been a little hard to research that. Is there another train station that has her, uh, you know, mark on it that if we were somewhere we would enjoy seeing? Um, that's a good question. Um, I know her most famous design was La Fonda, mm. uh, which was a lodge and I in Santa Fe in Santa Fe. And I think she also uh, was involved in this with the station in Wichita. Mm. Uh, but I don't know specifically other stations. Oh, I'll, I'll go to Wichita. Okay. And I'll check it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, over here. Earlier this year, I walked down to um, Union Station to pick up my niece who was coming in from Claremont on the Metrolink and got there about <coughs> half an hour <coughs> early and was told I couldn't sit down any place um, during the time that you had um, restricted all the seats to people who had Metrolink trains or tickets or Amtrak tickets. And you've now opened up some of them. But um, does the master plan address um, how the public is going to be able to use the public space? <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that, that is an excellent question. I'm going to avoid the whole politics of why the seats got uh, roped off in the first place. Um, but the master plan absolutely creates um, large public amenity spaces for the passengers. And it's, it's really our desire and our expectation that people are going to enjoy being at the station and we'll stay there and we'll have places to sit. We have two large, um, uh, we call them wells, but uh, they're, they're these lounge areas that uh, are intended for, for people, whether they're on Metrolink or Amtrak or, or just want to hang out in the station to be hanging out in. Uh, and we think they'll be really wonderful places where you can look up and see the trains through openings in the platforms that allow daylight to come in and so really connect the activity of the train yard with the concourse and be a pleasant place to uh, want to be. And uh, so yes, we, we expect it to be a very public space with lots of amenity, great <laughs> bars, restaurants, cafes, shoe shines. <laughs> First, Ms. Musicant, thank you very much for giving a shout out to Ira Yellen because uh, he brought me to Union Station 20 years ago. And I'm Tara Thomas and I uh, operate Trax Restaurant there. And I have done so for 18 years. And um, it's been a struggle and um, it, it's been a wonderful process and we're all moving through it. Um, but. My real question is, how did you come up with the name No Further West for this show? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, not nearly as exciting as it might sound. <laughs> uh, I believe that there is a drink available at Trax called No Further West. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so after tonight's talk, we can all go get a drink at Trax, and um, that was the inspiration for the title. Actually, it's That's much more inspired than that because if you look very closely at the gold painting in the one painting, 
panel in the room at Trax, if you look very carefully, it no further west is embedded in it. Oh. And there's a big um, story behind that, but um, thank you. And it was, it was kind of an honor and an insult at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's a great th story. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'll tell you the story at another time. Next question. Oh, I have a, and sort of an architectural history question, because it seems to me Union Station, very beautiful structure, but it sort of comes after the heyday of Mission Revival and the romanticization of the California period. And I'm trying to think if there is a significant building built in that style after Union Station. So in some ways, you know, within the cultural history of Los Angeles, it's, it's almost a little anachronistic. Uh, mm. I, I would absolutely agree. It's probably the last example at that scale. There are some other large-scale mission revival projects. Um, the Herald Examiner building is, is one example. Uh, and there are certainly the Myron, a lot of Myron Hunt examples, for example, on the campus at Caltech. Uh, but it was very late for Union Station. Uh, to, to be built in the Mission Revival style, but I honestly don't think the railroads cared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is, I guess, for our historian, but the Chinatown was displaced to build uh, the station. So what was displaced to move Chinatown to its uh, current location? What was displaced? What was there on uh, What was there Broadway? originally yeah. that it was handed over seemingly easily to uh, You're the speaking of the new location on Broadway? Yeah. Yeah, that was a, an old Santa Fe maintenance yard, which had become surplus. Mm -hmm. So actually, there's another history f before that. It was actually the site of a brickyard uh, in the uh, what's presently the Chinatown area. There were about half a dozen brickyards. Uh, Bernard Street, for example, was the location of uh, Jean Bernard's brickyard. He was an immigrant from Switzerland who operated the, a site there. Uh, but Chinatown, the new Chinatown that was developed was about a four acre plaza, pedestrian plaza that was created to <laughs> actually uh, uh, counter the, uh, the uh, prevalent perception or image of Chinatown as a dark and dangerous and seedy place. Uh, so the architects there, uh, Adrian Wilson and Earl Webster, uh, created a, a facility with wide open plazas, which remain today. And uh, the style of the buildings reflected a, a kind of a popular style at that time, the, 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 uh, the sort of a neo-Mediterranean -Medi revival style with uh, Asian oriental uh, uh, <laughs> ornamentation added on. Uh, but, you know, they all had to meet local building codes. And, of course, Asian oriental revival, I think. They call it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Diversity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the question of um, how to get to Union Station, uh, uh, you know, like across Alameda and so forth, um, that was something of thinking about even before this. And, during the period that questions were weeks and months ago being asked for by the uh, people who were redesigning and so forth, the Union Station, I brought up a couple of times um, the question about access from the current gold line to the tracks beneath ground level, which are the red and purple lines. And there's no direct access. What This was an afterthought, obviously. That it wasn't designed well but just simply a continuation of an escalator or a stairway th through the main ground level to the underground would be so much of a help in terms of access because, of course, the gold line was not designed when the Union Station was designed, and I don't think it was even designed to be where it was when the red line and mm -hmm. Purple Line subway was designed. So is there any plan to link those? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying... Uh, w what consideration has been given to that suggestion, mm -hmm. if anyone besides myself might have made that suggestion? Mm 
It, it's actually something that, uh, you know, as we're nosing around the station and, and trying to figure out what all the problems are and trying to figure out how to solve all the problems, um, that that is one that, you know, ab absolutely rises to the top. And in the master plan concourse, you will see, and hopefully you'll get to come to our uh, community meeting uh, uh, next week, and so a little plug again for that. Uh, but uh, you, you will see that we have uh, taken in these lounge areas that I was talking about, one of the lounges actually is a connection between the gold line and the red line and, and takes advantage of the proximity of those to um, really connect the red line better to the concourse level and right at the, at the location of the gold line. So uh, while it's not one direct staircase going all the way down, it's really a, a much uh, more streamlined connection for any of the transfers that occur there. And we, we've also poked around. We, we found a, a great solution for a little knockout panel, but really we're, we're pushing for the entire uh, master plan, so uh, we're, we're really not looking for the interim uh, projects quite yet, but uh, we, we've come up with a few. One over here. Thank you. Um, to continue the ping-ponging back and forth, I want to go back to the past. I'm fascinated by this great sycamore tree mm. that I have not heard very much about, and I read about it very tangentially here and there in history books. Can anyone talk about the great sycamore tree that was near Union Station? The Elisa sycamore, I believe. Elisa sycamore, I believe it's called, right? Anybody know anything about that? Well, it, a number of people have Reality. tried to research and locate that original sycamore, uh, Aliso being a sycamore in Spanish, mm. Mm. Uh, and it's somewhere probably out in the middle of the 101 freeway and the Hollywood freeway, <laughs> mm. <laughs> unfortunately. At this tree, I mean, I understood it was like a gathering place. Uh, it was a point on the map of the Pueblo, so when the plaza and the original Pueblo was laid out, uh, you know, in the old days, the diseños, the maps of the Pueblo identified by uh, the big rock at the corner over here next to the, the river or the tree that was here. Uh, it could have been a gathering place, but, you know, over time as uh, industrial development evolved around it, there was a gas plant, there was a brewery, there were uh, other facilities that that developed so that ultimately when the 101 freeway came through, then it was just expendable. Mm. And I, then I think it was showing its age, as I recall reading. Yeah. It was and if I may uh, add, you know, there were other institutions that were at this location. You know, it, it was not just Chinatown, but you had facilities like the, the Daughters of Charity had a, uh, uh, had their facility. It was uh, an infirmary, a college, uh, uh, a school for girls uh, that uh, at the corner where the mosaic apartments are today, mm. uh, all of that was uh, ultimately sold to Southern Pacific for its team tracks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 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 that's another example of, of the erasure of memory. You know, mm. some of our early institutions, uh, the infirmary became sort of the uh, hospital that served the uh, the poor, so it was the early county hospital for Los Angeles. Hmm. Hmm. She's mi the microphone's over here. Before Union Station, where were the three major depots located, and where are their archives now? Hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with locations of the stations. Uh, the, well, the Santa Fe station was on Santa Fe. The um, kind of near where Sciarc is, across the street from Sciarc. Oh, specifically, okay. Okay, and uh, the Southern Pacific Station was on Fifth Street, um, and Fifth Street was uh, closed off; it didn't go through. It was the terminus of Fifth Street, and the Salt Lake Station was on the east side of the river near First Street. And was the Southern Pacific Station that was at Fifth? Was that also where the original arcade station? That was the arcade station, okay. exactly. And Central Station was just built right there as well? Central Station was built adjacent to it. So uh, there's actually a great aerial photograph that shows 
uh, the arcade station and Central Station right next to each other. Which one were Laurel and Hardy dancing at? Was it? The oh, I don't scene? know about that. Oh, this <laughs> what is, is really, this? This is a nice video of Laurel and Hardy dancing outside. I believe it was arcade station, but I'm not oh, sure. Wow. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Next question. Next question over here. Okay. Hold on. Uh, I was just wondering if anyone could talk about the Fred Harvey House restaurant, and um, I'm just curious why it's been vacant since 1967. Hasn't? And I assume in the master plan you're going to try and get a reuse for it. Uh, I can I can tell you I I can't tell you exactly why it's been vacant. I mean the Harvey House closed as you know train travel declined and there wasn't. Weren't a lot of people. You can correct no me. Business. No business. No mm -hmm. um, business. We, you know, when Metro's owned the station for about three years now. So as we get our bearings and figuring out, we are working with uh, a leasing agent on bringing in some activity. And one of the early thoughts with the master plan is the first thing we need to do is reactivate all these now vacant spaces, the ticketing hall, right, which is mostly also closed to the public and the Fred Harvey. We have events. I will say we make revenue. We have weddings and different events that happen there, but we want it reactivated as a civic public place. Um, and I think very soon we're going to be able to have an announcement about a use for the Fred Harvey, um, a restaurant use. I can't, I can't say yet, but hmm. it's coming. And actually, one other thing I want to add that's exciting is when our team started working on the master plan, we talked about, okay, we got to do this, we got to do the front of the station and connect so that we get interest from the market. But what's happened and what's really exciting is people get it and they're excited that we're doing this and they're already coming. So they're coming ahead of us even doing these changes. We have all this interest in bringing restaurants and new retail amenities. So I'm hopeful again in the next few weeks, watch out in the papers and we'll have a media alert for you <laughs> that we'll, we'll have a new announcement for that space. Tara, you know anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> For our historian, uh, two, uh, two questions really sort of tied together about the geography. Um, a lot of people refer to where Union Station is as the original location of Chinatown. And I'm not completely sure, but uh, was or was not Chinatown originally technically located across Alameda Street off of what was called Negro Alley at the time, and in between that and and Alameda, and later expanded over. That's my first question. And the second one is you were talking about uh, where Chinatown was placed, um, talking about the brick factories was th that were there. Was that previously Sonora Town? Hmm. Uh, first part, the uh, original site of Chinatown was right at the intersection of Los Angeles Street and the uh, Hollywood Freeway. So Calle de los Negros was just parallel to Los Angeles Street and just to the east. Uh, that location, that area, primarily was developed with adobe buildings and then expanded with many wood frame structures. By the 1880s, the Chinatown community had expanded east across Alameda and uh, almost concurrently with the development of many of the brickyards, uh, <laughs> the newer buildings that replaced the old wooden buildings tended to be made of brick. So when we refer to old Chinatown, we talk about the um, expanse on both sides of Alameda from uh, Aliso and Arcadia north to, um, to uh, what is now Cesar Chavez or Macy Street previously. So um, the community totaled about 3,000 people by the 1930s, uh, and approximately half of it was displaced for the Union Station construction. And where was Sonora Town? Sonora Town, the second part of the question, was north of uh, Macy Street uh, on streets like Main, New High, oh. uh, and Spring. Uh, you know, the automobile era, unfortunately, caused the uh, demolition of many old residential hotels and apartment structures. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, go to the Natural History Museum, uh, which has, and, this, and the Getty and, or, and the Huntington, and look at old photos, you'll see many more uh, brick structures that occupied those streets than there are today. Uh, and the automobile era suddenly, suddenly made a parking lot more valuable mm. than a two or three story uh, apartment building. 
So Sonoratown was, of course, uh, got its name because of the many residents from the state of Sonora in Mexico who had settled in the area. Uh, so, you know, every town had ultimately uh, had its Chinese district and its Mex Mexican district. And so by the 1920s and 30s, that area had, had uh, uh, the moniker of Sonora Town. Hmm. Great. So we probably have two more questions. Okay, great. Uh, this is kind of a, a question into the future. You talk about going uh, through the station rather than stopping in and backing out. That implies a lot more track on the, down, on the downstream side. What are you going to get rid of in the way of buildings, and what are you going to take over in the way of land? Um, well, I can I can take a stab at that. There the there was a study done by Amtrak and Caltrans in 0506, and they actually took a plan through environmental. So yes, when they carry the tracks over the freeway, there was some property displacement just on the other side of Commercial Street, if you know where that is, along the southern side of the freeway, and then it would connect back in to the rail tracks that are along the river. Because that's the idea, is you just make a loop and, and get back. Um, we are re-looking at that. I mean, we have just started our, our, I think our consultants are just getting a notice to proceed. So they're looking at changing a bit the alignments. So I can't tell you exactly, but there will likely be, you know, some displacement impact to some of the properties um, just south of the freeway. A lot of it is, actually there's a bit of like city-owned property and kind of industrial-ish kind of uses. There's a strip club. Um, so <laughs> our big joke is that we our entitlements on the property right now on Union Station are really, really broad. I've never seen anything like it in the city of LA. We could build anything but a strip club or a mortuary, but there's a strip club across the street. So, <laughs> yeah, that, so it might go away. But um, So we don't know yet, but we're actually just starting this, re-looking re -looking at that, and that is one of the pieces of the environmental. So in the next year, we'll be able to answer that question. The last uh, honor goes to you. This is a question to uh, the historian, to uh, Ms. Musicant. I noticed in the index of the book there wasn't much on the romance of Hollywood and Hollywood stars. Can you comment a little bit on the romance of the Hollywood stars with the Union Station? Can you be more specific? <laughs> a lot of people Hollywood like stars Clark came Gable through Union and, Station. Uh, people like what, Humphrey Bogart, that era. You know, that, it's just a little bit outside my expertise. Uh -huh. But you do talk Sorry about, the, book about the, the number of movies that were shot there, I yes. believe. There yes. were, there have been a lot you of know, different dozens, films shot and, there. Um, I think also, isn't some of the interesting record of Chinatown really from the silent movies? Um, there was a, a, a researcher here about a year ago talking about his book showing locations of the silent movies, huh. showing a lot of um, images of Chinatown um, mm -hmm. before it was torn down. Well, you know, the completion of Union Station really coincided with the uh, rise of talkies. Mm. So uh, the, the Good Earth uh, was filmed in 1937, mm. uh, New Chinatown, was built in 1938. Union Station opened in 1939. Mm -hmm. So all of that occurred at a point in time when, when this industry was just exploding. So it was natural that all the, the Bogarts and the, all the mm -hmm. Hollywood stars would be seen at this train station. And yeah, it. yeah. Uh, so I don't know, are people allowed to go up to the exhibit um, tonight or is it closed? Library's closed. Okay. So pretend I didn't say that. <laughs> and uh, it's not closed. But uh, thank you all very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you.